13. We're going to begin here in verse number 1. Now, Romans chapter number 13 is a pretty famous chapter. It's spoken of a lot. Everybody here is probably somewhat familiar with it. And it's the chapter on government. Now, just as we've looked at all the other chapters, all the other parts of the book of Romans, the, the Romans chapter 13 isn't immune by, by, from being abused. Just like Romans 9, they grab a hold of that, Calvinists do, and they twist Romans 9. There's a lot of false interpretations of Romans 13 as well. I'm going to go over just a couple of them right now of what they are. I know it's going to go off, but hopefully. Um, number one, people will take, and here, let me say this first. The overall point or the overall topic or context of Romans chapter number 13 is speaking of just government in general. It's just the generalization of government. Now, there are a few different views of, of how this is abused. Number one is this passage will be taken from someone or taken by someone into meaning that, you know, you should just do whatever the government says in all situations, and it doesn't matter what the Bible says, you should just always follow the government. That's what they'll say that this passage is te teaching, which is incorrect. Number two, there, there are the hardcore, like, anarchists, which will say, you know, we don't need to, you know, uh, you know, follow any rules from the government. We don't need to listen to anything that they say. You know, we just go by just what the Bible says only. And that's what their mantra would be in that case. Now, I'm going to show you, obviously, number one, the Bible is the final authority. And I'm, we're going to get into this. And that's the final authority. And if the government comes up with a law that contradicts the Bible, I go with the Bible and I, and I reject the law of, of the government. If I'm not able to keep the law of the Bible and the government is teaching, hey, you're not allowed to have a Bible. You're not allowed to read your Bible. Well, I'm going to break that law of the government. Right. If the government tells you, hey, you're not allowed going door to door, you know, telling people about the gospel... When Jesus says, go ye therefore into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, well, I'm going to break that law. I'm going to, I'm going to obey God rather than men. Right. But this is, this is overall, I'm going to get into this in just a moment and, and, and actually show you what this chapter teaches is this. God has instituted the ordinance or he has given the institution. Let me word it that way. He has given himself the institution of government. There should be government. You know, this idea that there should be no government is wrong. God, when he was, you know, ruling over the nation of the Old Testament, he instituted the government and he gave laws. We should have a government, right? So God wants there to be government. Now, what he wants us to do is he wants us to keep the, the laws of your government, just like I said, as long as they do not contradict the Bible. So if there is a law, we're going to get into this, and I'm going to prove this from, from the Bible here. If there is a law that does not cause you, that, uh, you know, to, to not be able to keep the law of the Bible, then you should keep that law. And that may, you know, all these like huge, you know, freedom people, and hey, I love my freedom too, but I'm going to go with whatever the Bible teaches. You know, I'm not, you know, I'm not an American first and a Christian second. I'm a Christian first and American second. Amen. You know, the Bible is my sole authority, and it doesn't matter what nation that I live in. This book is what's going to decide, you know, what I believe and what I'm going to do in my life. Right. Romans chapter number 13, verse number 1 says, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. Now he's going to explain what he's talking about. He's talking about government. For there is no power but of God. The powers that be, that's a specific reference to the government. The powers that be are ordained of God. Now I'm going to show you when it says the powers that be are ordained of God, that it is referring to just the, insti the general institution of government. Verse number 2 says this, Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, watch this, resisteth, resisteth, the ordinance of God. So when they're resisting the power, what are they resisting? He says the ordinance of God. So he's not speaking of a specific government. He's just saying just the ordinance. What's that mean? The institution of government. So if you are totally against any government at all, if you are you know, against you know, uh, you know, different laws of your government, and you're just not keeping the local laws, state laws, federal laws, whatever they may be, just because you're an anarchist and you think you, you, know, you can do whatever you want, that's not biblical. If you're resisting those laws and they're not causing you to not keep the Bible's laws, then you're in sin according to the Bible. You're resisting the ordinance of God. The laws that you know, are an institution that, law, that God is for. Notice the end of the, the, the latter part, the part B of, of verse number 2. It says this. 
And they that resist, talk about resisting the powers that be, you know, we would, we would say government. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. Now, when the Bible uses the word damnation right there, a lot of people are confused sometimes. Like the word, the Bible will use the word condemnation or damnation. It's not always talking about going to hell. A lot of people, when they hear that, they're not familiar with that language. When that says damnation, it's just talking about something bad is going to happen. Whether that be physical, sometimes it can be spiritual. In this sense, it's talking about a physical punishment from the government, saying that that's not, it's not going to end well for you. So it would be a physical punishment from the government. Now look at verse number three. For rulers are, are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. So verse number three says, for rulers are not a terror to good works. Terror is something that, you know, uh, the word terror means that it is, it is inflicting fear upon you. It's causing you to be afraid. That's what that means when it says terror. It's instilling terror. And it says rulers, like a ruler of a government, you know, someone that is in authority or power in a government, they're not going to scare. They're not a terror when someone's doing good works. You're not going to be afraid if you're living your life right, if you're not breaking the laws and things like that, not to good works, but to evil. Now, are there exceptions of this? Throughout time. I mean, there are a lot of communist countries that have done horrible things in the past, and those rulers were not, they were a terror to good works. They were. There have been times when people have banned the Bible. Now, if that's the ultimate, you know, uh, you know, irony to this verse here, the exact opposite, where countries have literally banned the Bible. And, it's, and I, I don't believe it's a coincidence at all, but almost all of the countries that were communist countries, they would, number one, they would always ban guns right before they go in and they just take everybody over and harm everyone. Number one, they start banning your guns. But number two, all of those countries ban the Bible. You think that's a coincidence? All of them. Look them up. Russia, China, they all ban the Bible. That's not a coincidence. Yeah, I mean, if you read here when it says, For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil, wilt thou, wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Saying there's nothing to fear if you're, if you're doing that, that which is right. Now, like I said, this is a generalization. He's just talking about the ordinance of government. There are exceptions to this. He's just generally speaking to those in Rome or just to any Christian. And obviously, every Christian is living under a different uh, system of government, right? A different quality of government, if you will. This is a generalization that, that you should, just by default, you should not have to fear rulers because the purpose of the ruler is is to uh, you know, judge that which is evil if you've done something wrong. Now, one of the views that I'm, I'm going to disprove right now is this. What some people will say in uh, you know, verse number it's verse number one. People will say in verse number one, you know, where the Bible reads, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. Then the Bible says this, for there is no power but of God. It says this, the powers that be are ordained of God. People will make this statement, a lot of Calvinists, of course, because they abuse a lot of these passages. People believe that every single political figure, every leader that has ever been in power, that God providentially placed that person there. That's not what the Bible teaches. I want you to turn to Hosea chapter number 8, verse number 4. They'll use that verse to, to supposedly bolster that position where the Bible says the powers that be are ordained of God. So they'll say, see, you know, any power, any power that, is, you know, anyone that is in power, anyone that is in the position of, of, of a governor, God placed them there. That's not what that's teaching. It's saying government in general, that God is pro-government as far as having a government, a sort of government. The powers that be are ordained of God. Now, we're going to Hosea, what did I say, chapter number 8, verse number 4. Hosea chapter number 8, verse number 4. Notice this statement. Now, keep in mind this is God speaking in the Old Testament. He says this. They have set up kings, talking about the nation of Israel. They set those kings into those positions. They have set up kings. Now, look at this. But not by me. What is he saying? He's saying they chose kings. But not by me. Not, not according to what I wanted. Now, it's so silly that a person that supposedly is a Christian and believes the Bible would say that, you know, God puts everyone in the position that they're supposed to be in. When God's first government, God's ideal government, 
was rejected by the people that were there at that time. God himself, he said that you, you haven't, uh, I can't remember the exact warning. Oh, he talks to Samuel. His, his statement, he's like, they didn't reject you, Samuel. They rejected me. So the ultimate power, the highest power, the people that lived at that time of the nation of Israel, they said they didn't want God. You know why? Because man has free will. I don't believe in this trash that man is just like forced to do certain things, that God preordains everything in this, in this life and he is sovereign over everything. God created man with free will. God did not put specific people in, in every single person in power. I don't believe for a second that these, these, these communist you know, leaders that killed millions and millions of people, that God wanted those people to be in authority. You know, these same Calvinists who believe that God just controls every aspect of life, they also believe that God preordained babies to die, babies to be murdered, you know, all this evil. If, if they literally, if you pin them down, you can, you can literally, they'll, they'll fess up to anything. If you talk to them about, you know, like horrible situations where like someone rapes, a man rapes a woman, they're like, yeah, you know, ultimately God controls all things. It's like, what in the world? That's not the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible gives man free will and man's the one that's evil. Right. Man is the one, the Bible says that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Right. Man's the one that's evil, and just like Adam and Eve had to choose whether or not they were going to eat of the fruit of the tree, man chooses what he's going to do in life. And God doesn't just put people in power, every single person in power and authority. People are like, oh, God, you know, God put Trump in that office. No, the Americans, you know, chose who they wanted to vote for. That's what, you know, took place in that situation. God doesn't just choose. Let's look at another example of this. So if you take this to its extreme, go to Revelation chapter 13. If you take this to its extreme where you say just every person, you know, every political leader that's ever existed, God wanted that person to be ruling. God wanted that person to be in power. Well, look what the Bible says in Revelation chapter number 13, verse number 2. There's a man that's coming that's known as the Antichrist. And it talks about him here in verse number 2. It says, And the beast which, which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear. This is allegorical. This is, this is a metaphor. It's something that represents a figure that represents a man that's coming. And his mouth as the mouth of a lion. So this is the, the Antichrist that will one day rule over the entire world. It says, and his mouth is as the mouth of a lion. And then watch this. And the dragon. So who's the dragon? Satan. Satan, exactly. It tells you that actually, I believe, in the chapter prior to this. It says, and the dragon. So Satan and the dragon gave him his power. Watch this. And his seat and great authority. So who put this person in to power? Was it God? No. no. Literally, Satan did. And I don't believe this is the only time that Satan has put someone into power. Right. I believe there's been many times throughout history where Satan tries to put people into power to harm and to hurt people. And right here is a clear example where you can prove without a shadow of a doubt that God did not want this person to be in power. God did not choose that, you know, that he would just you know, uh, you know, be into power and just hurt all these people, but rather that Satan put the, gave this person, the dragon gave him his seat and his power and it says in great authority. God did not. Like it says in the Old Testament, you know, it tells you that they have set up kings and God says, but not by me. I didn't want those guys to be ruling. You know, God wants a righteous person to be in power. Right. God doesn't want the evil to be in power. Go back to Romans chapter number... 13, Romans chapter number 13. So we can see that when it, when it makes the statement that the powers that be are ordained of God, it cannot be saying that every person that's in power is ruling because there are multiple, there are scores of time in the Bible where the Bible teaches that people that are ruling, God doesn't want them to be ruling. It's, when it says the powers that be are ordained of God, it's interpreted by Romans 13, 2, when it says, Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, so what is the power? resisted the ordinance of God. So the power is the ordinance. The power, we would say government. When the Bible is using the word power right here, it's, it's basically saying government. What is a governor? Someone that, you know, if you think of like a governor that's, that, that maybe your company, if you drive a company vehicle, they put a governor, right, and on, on that vehicle so that you can't go over a certain limit. What is that? It's basically your boss. It's basically telling you you're not going over this speed, right? It's ruling the, the, the it's, it's telling you, you know, you, you can do this to, to here. And that's what a governor does. He says, hey, here's laws and you're allowed to do this to here, right? 
That makes sense? Yeah. So when it says uh, power here, it's basically saying govern, uh, government. That's pretty much what it's speaking of. So the ordinance of God is the government. So we see that God does not put everyone into power. That's not what it's saying. Look at verse number four. The Bible says, for he is the minister of God, just speaking in general about people that work for the government, for he is the minister of God to thee for good. So in general, those that work for the government, what is their job? Their job is to do good, right? Their job is to do things good, right? But if thou do that which is evil, so if his job is to do good, and you do that which is evil, be afraid, right? So if, if, if you, know, you are breaking laws, well, then you should be afraid because you're going to be punished. That's what it's teaching. Keep reading. For he beareth not the sword in vain, for he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Now, notice what it specifically mentions when it talks about this minister of God, this person that works for the government, right? It's just any government worker, it's just referring to, just in general here. But then it tells you something specific. It says, for he beareth not the sword in vain. So this minister is obviously the one that is, he is the one that is, uh, he's, he's, like it says, executing wrath. His job is to execute punishment. Now, what does it mention? What does he have? He has a sword, right? Now, there's a lot of people in the, that, that think that the Old Testament is just like totally different than the New Testament. That, you know, when Jesus came, just everything changed. You know, every, you know, the Old Testament was mean and bad and all those laws are all gone. And so many Christians today think that the New Testament, that the, that the death penalty is done away with. This guy doesn't have a sword to go around tickling people. You know what I'm saying? Like, he has a sword. What do you use a sword for? To kill someone, right? There, the Bible is very clear that there are certain crimes where you deserve the death penalty. Amen. And people that are against the death penalty, people that, that think that the death penalty should not be instituted, you know, those people are, are causing harm to other, be, others. Because here's the thing. If you look up all the stuff in the Bible in the Old Testament where God institutes the death penalty for sp specific crimes, do you know why he does so? It's because those people are a menace to society. And he wants to prevent them from hurting other people. Because God loves people. He, you know, there are, there, he, this is what people need to wake up from a fairy tale. And they need to realize there are very evil people that live in this world. Right. There are very evil people who look for an opportunity. The Bible talks about there are people that cannot sleep unless they harm others. There are people that are sitting in their houses right now who would love to hurt your children. I mean, that's just a sad fact. It's right. true. There are people that, that enjoy harming people. You know, and I don't like that, and I wish that we didn't live in that type of world, but that's a fact. And there will always be evil, and there will always be good. And the Bible teaches that a way, God, God actually instituted that a way to protect the good is that you would institute the death penalty. Now, people today also, Christians, uh, that, that some, a lot of times are for the death penalty, they want to pick and choose, as a Christian, what, you know, what uh, punishments or what crimes deserve the death penalty? Well, I think God knows better than I do. So I just let God decide. Whatever God says these people deserve the death penalty, whatever crimes, I allow God to tell me. Because I'm not smarter than God. I, you know, I'm just a person that's, that's you know, just every, the only things that I've learned, I've only had a few years on this earth, and he knows all things. So I'm just going to allow God to tell me. And it's, and it's hypocritical when people will pick and choose well, I think murderers deserve the death penalty, but I don't think that, whatever, kidnappers, because the Bible teaches that someone that has kidnapped someone deserves the death penalty. It's like, well, where do you get that? Where are you getting you know, your, your opinions from? Because it's not the Bible. That's obviously not where you're getting it from. I, I, you know, the Bible teaches the law of the Lord is perfect. Amen. And I trust God when he says, and I don't care whether my culture thinks that's radical or not. I think they're radical. I think, I think their system doesn't work very well. If you look at how the, the country, the, the direction that the country is going in, it doesn't look like you're really, really rehabilitating these people that come out like fourfold, you know, worse the child of hell than they were before they went into a prison. Right. You know, I'd much rather a lot of these, a lot of these, you know, freaks and weirdos that have like, you know, uh, perverted all these children and hurt all these children. I'd rather not pay for their next meal. I wish that God would, I wish we could bring back God's law. And then we would do away with these people.
people, and I wouldn't have to pay for them. And then, you know, in 15, 20 years, they let these people out as if things are fixed, and then they go hurt some other kid. Right. They ruin some kid's life for, you know, ruin some kid's life forever. That kind of stuff never gets old. It never go, they never get over that. Right. You know, so why don't we just go with, well, I think God knows best. And I think God knows how to protect those people that are good. And you know what? If you're not an evil person, then you don't need to worry about it. That's what this passage is teaching. Amen. Just do that which is good, and then you don't have to worry about it. But the Bible says very clearly that there are certain times where he beareth not the sword in vain. It's saying he doesn't have that sword for no reason. You know, he has that sword because there are evil people out there. And that's not going to go away. You know, evil people will always exist. Now, I want you to notice something else, too. At the end of verse number four, it says this. A revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Now, notice it says that this minister of God, specifically, is a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth good. Flip back over to Romans chapter number 12. Look there at the, the end. <clears throat> notice the end of the chapter. This is why verse-by-verse -verse preaching is very important. And instead of just like if I, when I preach you know, uh, topical preaching, I might like just focus on one thing and then bounce around. But you'll notice continuity of chapters when we go from chapter 12, chapter 13, chapter 14. Now, what was the end of chapter number 12? Do you guys remember? Don't revenge yourselves. Allow God to revenge you, right? You, you know, when we, should, we should go around and do good to all men. It's not my job to put these people to death. It's not my job to do anything, even if it's not just the death penalty. There are other punishments. If you steal something from someone, you know, you know, you're, you're supposed to pay fourfold to that person. You know, there, there are all, all different types of punishments. It's not my job to try to right all the wrongs. I'm just supposed to do what the Bible says. I'm just supposed to do that which is right, and then God will right the wrongs, right? Amen. Now, if you notice there in verse number 17, chapter number 12, verse number 17, it says this. Recompense to no man evil for evil. So when someone does something wrong to you, you shouldn't do wrong back, right? Notice what he says there. That provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as life in you, live peaceably with all, all men. Now look at verse 19. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. Right? For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Then we flip over, right? And he starts talking about government. And God says that God, God want, he ordained this system of government. And there are people that are there to administer the death penalty. And he's the minister of God. So what he, why he's going into this next is he's telling you, don't avenge yourselves. If someone does you wrong, you don't avenge yourself. God has a system in place, and God can. Here's the thing. You know, it's, he's the God of the universe. The same God that, that created the universe can intervene in any moment. And if someone has done you wrong and you're a child of God, you're a Christian, you know, and you pray to God for, you know, that, that you would recompense that person, that you would be, you know, uh, recompensed, I guess is the, only, is the word I was looking for, recompensed. God has this system in place where he can, you know, uh, you know, he can be the revenger. He has a revenger to execute wrath upon people. That's why this just segues right into that topic. You don't avenge yourselves. God has a system that will do that. This, he's the minister of God. Look at the next verse there. Wherefore, verse number five, wherefore ye must needs be subject, saying it's necessary for you to be subject, talking about to your government. And, and, a lot, and all these people that are like hardcore, you know, uh, they're like anarchists, they don't want to follow the government. They, this, is, this is why, right? They just hate this word subject right there. It's what the Bible teaches. You know, if you want to be pleasing to God, if you want to keep, God, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Well, part of it is to be subject to your government. So if you love God, just do what he says and just be subject to your government, right? Amen. Wherefore, you must needs be subject, watch this, not only for wrath, so not only because you're afraid of, of the punishment, he says, watch this, but also for conscience sake. Why does it say that? Because he's the minister of God. Because God can be, you know, you could be the one that if you return evil for evil, God can make sure that you get punished. You could be the one doing that, right? So it says there, verse number 6, For for this cause pay ye tribute also, for they are God's ministers attending continually upon this very thing. Now there are so many different interpretations of verse number 6, and again, it's because people just want the Bible to say something different than what it says. People just don't like paying taxes. I don't like paying taxes, but verse number 6, where when it says in verse number 6, For for this cause 
pay ye tribute also. Tribute is, uh, those are taxes. Right. You should pay taxes. Uh, let's look at a couple of passages here. Look, go, go to Matthew chapter number 17, verse number 24. Matthew chapter number 17, verse number 24. So he says, now, <clears throat> let's look at actually what he's saying there. And I'm going to read it again to you. For, for this cause. The word for means because. Because for this cause, he's saying, pay ye tribute. So why should you pay tribute? Because you are supporting your government in doing that which is right. Now, of course, the, the government can be corrupt and the government can do evil and wicked things. But he says you should still pay your taxes. That's what this teaches. Now, let's look at an example of Jesus. When Jesus walked on this earth, Matthew chapter number 17, obviously the perfect example, God in the flesh. Let's look at what he says about paying taxes. Matthew 17, verse number 24. <clears throat> Matthew 17, verse number 24. It says this, And when they were come to Capernaum, they that received tribute money, so they that received taxes, they that received tribute money came to Peter and said, Doth not your master, talking about Christ, doth not your master pay tribute? He's saying, Does your, doesn't your master, doesn't Jesus pay taxes? He saith, yes. So let's just stop for a second. If Jesus was on this earth today, would he pay taxes? Yes, yes he would. Jesus is your example. I mean, that, that alone, we're going to look at a little bit more, but that alone is it's game over. Right. You should be following Christ's example, and you should be paying taxes. Now look what it says. Yes, and when he was coming to the house, Jesus prevented him. That means he came before him. That's what the, the prevent means, to come before. Saying, that's, it, it's he approached him. What thinkest thou, Simon? He's saying, what do you think, Simon? He's talking to Simon Peter. Of whom do the kids of the earth, kings of the earth take custom or tribute? Now he's going to teach you something about taxes here, though. This is important. Of whom do the kings of the earth take custom or tribute? So who, who do they take taxes from? Watch what he says. Of their own children or of strangers? So the kings of the earth, do they take taxes of their own children or of strangers? What's the answer? Strangers, strangers right? Strangers. <clears throat> Peter saith unto him, of strangers. Jesus saith unto him, now watch this. Then are the children free. So he says, then are the children free. Verse 27. Notwithstanding, lest we should offend them, Go thou to the sea, and cast in hook, and take up the fish that first cometh out, first cometh up, and when thou hast opened his mouth, thou shalt find a piece of money. T that take, and give unto them for me and thee. So he miraculously caused the money to be in this fish's mouth. Peter's a fisherman, he goes and fishes, he gets the money out of the mouth, and he goes and he gives it to them, right? Right? But notice verse 27 when he says at the end. So he, he basically states that they're not taking this money of their own children. They're taking it of strangers. Now that alone, the way that he's wording it, what is he trying to say? It's not right, right? So here's the thing. Should you pay taxes? Yes. You know, is it right just to force strangers to pay? I mean, what makes the government any different than myself, right? There should be government, yes. But they're just these random people and then they decide. It's, it's so funny to me. Like oftentimes when like one family will do wrong to another family, one person will do wrong to a family, it's like the government, you know, will cause there to be a fine, and then and then the 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 guy that did wrong to this family, the guy will have to pay the government, and then the family gets nothing. It's like, why are you getting money? Like that doesn't even make sense. Why wouldn't they pay the person that they did wrong? Right. Like, does that even make sense? Now, obviously, punishments should take place, you know, and then that would be, you know, righting the wrong in that case. But here in this case, he says that, that in this situation where Jesus is speaking unto his, his disciple Peter, he says that they're taking it from strangers, and then he says, notwithstanding. So even though they're taking it from strangers, saying it's not right, I know, but pay taxes anyway. So that's what he's saying. Notwithstanding, lest we should offend them. What's the reason why? Let those words sink down into your ears, lest we should offend them. There are some great men of God that waste their lives fighting the government. They waste their lives fighting the government. And you know what they, they could be doing? Knocking on people's doors and giving them the gospel and getting more people in heaven, getting more people saved. But they waste their entire lives you know, fighting some battle, whatever it may be. Not paying taxes, whatever it may be. Lester Roloff, I 100% believe Lester Roloff was saved. 
I've heard him say so many great statements, you know, that are, that are about salvation, just perfectly in line with salvation. He said some, you know, some confusing things, but I believe the man was saved. I've heard him say some really clear statements when he was pinned down on salvation. People will get caught into, well, you've got to repent of your sins and be saved. You've got to change your life. That's not what you have to do to be saved. Just believe only. Sometimes people will just hear that and they'll just repeat it. Well, repent of your sins. When that phrase, repent of your sins, is not found in the Bible one time. Right. Repent of your sins isn't in the Bible one time, ever. Amen. But people say, you've got to repent of your sins to be saved. Can you show me a verse where the Bible says that? You can't, because the Bible teaches the one time the question is asked in the entire Bible, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Amen. That's Amen. the only time, it's talked about a lot, but that's the only time the question is asked in the entire Bible. Right. That's it. That's the only time. If you think you're getting to heaven because, you know, if you think that, that, that we have to get to heaven by being a good person, well, then you're saying that Jesus died for no reason. You're saying, I, you know, I can just do it myself. What he did, I didn't need that. The whole reason he came down and died for your sins is because you're a sinner and you're not good enough to make it. Amen. There's none righteous, no, not one. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible's super clear. You know, there, here, here's the clearest verse in the entire Bible. If anyone saw it with me, this is the verse I always use repeatedly. Therefore, we conclude. What does conclude mean? This is the conclusion. So if we're talking about salvation, this is the conclusion. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified or saved, that a man is justified by faith. What is faith? Believing. Believing. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith, listen to this, without the deeds of the law. Can that be any clearer? The conclusion is you're saved by faith without the deeds of the law. Amen. I mean, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. You're not saved of yourself. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Is it gift something you work for? Is it gift something you pay for? No. no. The person that's, the, the giver pays for it. Jesus paid for it on the cross. Right. It is the gift of God. Listen to these words. Not of works, lest any man should boast. And the Bible is super clear. You're not saved by works. You're saved by faith alone. Amen. Now, when Jesus here is speaking to them, when he says, lest we should offend them, he's saying, unless we would offend them, and you would go to jail. What would happen if they offended him? They would go to jail, right? Like I was saying, Lester Roloff, who's a great man of God, wasted so much of his life fighting the government. Just tons of his life. You know, he was, he was in jail a couple of times because he was, he, you know, he had those homes where, you know, you know, he lived obviously at a different time in the 60s. He had those homes where he would bring in those troubled kids. He'd get them saved and then change their life. And they would start serving God. And they, you know, they were, you know, asking for taxes, trying to get him to get licensed. I agree with some of about him being licensed because they were actually going to cause him not, be, not to be able to discipline the children the way the Bible teaches it. But he was against paying taxes and stuff, which the, Jesus said, notwithstanding, lest we should offend them. So, I mean, as far as the tax situation goes... That's not a debate. You know, some things in the Bible are, are, can be a little bit ambiguous, and you might not be able to understand them, but should you pay taxes as a Christian? Yes. There's no question about that. Let's look at a couple other ones, because this is something people always want to argue about. I want to make sure everybody understands this real well, that you should pay taxes. Let's turn to another passage. Go to, while you're in Matthew, go to Matthew 22, verse 15. Matthew 22, verse 15. <clears throat> Matthew 20, chapter 22, look at verse 15. The Bible says... Then, then went the Pharisees and took counsel how they might entangle him in his talk. So they're trying to like catch him in his words. That's what we would say. Entangle means catch. So they're trying to catch him in his words, entangle him in his talk. And they sent out unto him their disciples with the Herodians, saying, Master, we know that thou art true and teachest the way of God in truth. Neither, care, n neither carest thou for any man... For thou regardest not the person of man. If somebody came up to me and said something like that, I'd be like, what do you want? Like the flattery is obvious. You know what I mean? You know, we know that thou art true. And look what he says. Verse 17. Tell us, therefore, what thinkest thou? So now they're going to ask him a question, right? They're trying to entangle him in his talk. Is it lawful to give tribute? So he's asking, is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar? That was the, the emperor of Rome, right, at that time? Or not? He's saying, should we pay taxes or no? But Jesus perceived their wickedness. So he knew what they were trying to do and said, Why tempt ye me? He's saying, Why test ye me? Why tempt ye me, ye hypocrites? Show me the tribute money. I mean, what a fool. Now, these people come to him and, they, and they're like, Hey, I got a question for you. And they're like, 
trying to entangle him in his talks, in his talk, and he like knows what they're doing. And he, he says to them, like, that Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, Why tempt ye me, ye hypocrites? And then he like tells them, Give me the money. So they're like having to do like what he says already. Like he takes control of the conversation immediately. Show me the tribute money. And they brought unto him a penny. So they brought unto him a penny, and he saith unto them, Who's in, whose is this image and superscription? He's saying, whose face is on a superscription? We would say, you know, in scriptures, normally what you use, a superscription is something that's on the top. So, you know, I'm not going to go into how, like, a penny's made, but, you know, it, it's obviously higher. The, the image is higher. We would normally put, the, like, a line on the outside. They obviously, like, you know, engraved around the outside of the image. So the image was up higher on the penny. I said I wasn't going to explain, but I did anyways. Whose is this image and superscription? So whose face is on it? They say unto him, Caesar. So it's Caesar's face. Then saith he unto them, render, that means give. Render means give. Render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's. So what's he saying? It's Caesar's penny, so pay him. Right. It's see, he, this is his penny. Just give him his money. Why? He already told you, lest we should offend him. Gee, you think Jesus wanted to go to jail? When he's going around, he's got a three-year ministry to preach the gospel to all of Israel. And he's like, I'm not paying you any taxes. They throw him in jail. It's like, what in the world? No. Just pay taxes so you don't go to jail. Are you free when you know, by paying taxes? I'm sorry, you're not. You know, Jesus said you're not free if you have to pay taxes. People, and, and I mean, this is still true today. People just assume like, you know, here's the thing. Our taxes right is a totally different discussion. Should you be taxed is a totally different conversation. You know, people say, well, we couldn't do anything without taxes. What was the first year we were taxed? Like 1914 or something? Is it around that time? 1918? Does anybody know? Nobody? No. Josh spoke for everybody. No, nobody knows. It's like 1914 or something like that. Do you know how many wars we won before that? Do you know how the Industrial Revolution take, took place? Our country was thriving without taxes. You don't have to have taxes. Our, America was great long before we paid taxes. At that time. Not, it's not any longer, but at that time, America was great at that time. And then it, it, it's funny, when we start paying taxes, everything goes to hell. Yeah. You know, after, because the government, they did that purposely. What they do is, when you, when, you know, when they, when, like in this situation where he's saying, where Jesus says, I don't want to get you off, on, off topic. But in this situation, he says, render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's. And then he says after that, and unto God the things that are God's. So you need to give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Pay taxes. It's his penny. Just pay it unto him. He's just, they're trying to catch him in his words, and he's just not letting it happen. And then he's like, but give unto God that which is God's. So do, you know, you need to be keeping God's commandments, right? But if there is some little commandment that's not going to, taxes do not prevent you from serving the Lord. So give unto God that which is God's, Right? And then whatever your government wants you to do, as long as it's not causing you to be disobedient to God, just do it. Why? Lest you should offend them. What if you spent half your life in jail? You, sir, you, really were, you really capped out on your maximum capacity of what you could have done for the Lord, huh? It's a waste. It's a waste of a life then, Amen. of a Christian that could be serving God and doing great things. Right. It's not that important. <clears throat> Let's look at... Uh, that's the last one we're going to go to about taxes. We'll go, to, uh, go back to Romans 13, get your hand there, and turn to 1 Peter chapter number 2. I think that point is proven pretty clearly that pay taxes, pay taxes. <clears throat> so here, in, uh, we, we stopped reading there in verse number 7. I want you to notice the statement. Render therefore to all their dues. Tribute to whom tribute is due. Saying whoever you, know, you owe taxes, whether it be your state... Whether it be, you know, the federal, just pay it to them. Custom, cu custom to whom custom. Custom is also like a tax. It's more of like, you know, like fees, if you will. It's something that's similar unto that. Mm -hmm. Custom to whom custom. And then it says fear to whom fear. Honor to whom honor. So keep your hand there. What I just read in Romans 13, we're going to compare this with 1 Peter chapter number 2. 1 Peter chapter number 2. <clears throat> Verse number 12, the Bible says this, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles. <clears throat> He's talking about living, a, conversation means the way that you live your life. Honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they, <clears throat> whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may, be, they may by your good works, which they behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. Verse number 13, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man, 
for the Lord's sake. I mean, look at that. It's super clear. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man. Why? For the Lord's sake. You say, why is it that big of a deal? I just want to keep God's laws. Well, one of God's laws is to keep your state's laws. So, for the Lord's sake, just like it said over in Romans, it said for conscience sake. Why? Because when you're violating your conscience when you break God's law. It's saying the exact same thing. So, why should you keep the laws of your land? As long, like I said, keep in mind, as long as it's not causing you to be disobedient to God's law, why? Because God said so. That's a simple answer. And it, shouldn't that be enough for us as Christians? If God says to do it, you need to do it. <clears throat> Notice the, the end of this, though. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. Watch this. Whether it be to the king as supreme, that would be like the king. So they lived in, you know, uh, they lived under the empire of Rome, right? So the king as supreme, and then it says, or unto governors. That would be like the state. So you have federal, and then you have state. It's a similar situation. Obviously, the authority structure is different. It's a different type of government, but similar situation. So he says, we're unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers. So notice how similar this is, speaking about the punishment of evildoers. And he says this, and for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God that with well-doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. He's saying the fact that you would keep the commandments of your land, <clears throat> is go it could be a testimony. Conversation means lifestyle. So it can be a testimony. You know, if you're in and out of jail all the time, you know, you're not, you know, you're not going to look that good to the world. People that aren't saved aren't going to be like, man, he's really got something going on that I need, right? I really need to start being like him, right? Of course not. So he's saying you need to be, you need to have a good testimony so that the Gentiles, Gentiles is heathen, Gentiles are those that are not saved. It says that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, like you're an evildoer, in verse 12 at the end there, they may by your good works, which they behold, glorify God in the day of visitation, saying that your lifestyle may be able to help convert them. Obviously, you have to be preached the gospel. You have to receive God's word in order to be saved. But you're, the way you live your life can have an effect on whether somebody gets saved or not. When somebody sees like, hey, their life is a lot more successful. Their relationship is a lot more successful. Whatever it may be, they are more successful at work. Whatever it may be. You know, then they realize, like, whatever he's doing works, and what I'm doing doesn't. And then they may come to you and ask you for advice about, you know, disciplining kids. Every time we go out to, to uh, you know, to, like, a store or something, people are always like, hey, your kids are so well-behaved. You have such, your kids, like, they're like, you know, if we're like, especially if they have to sit down, like, in a waiting area. I mean, you know, we, our kids are used to going to church. And everything, but we discipline our kids. And if we have to go to like an area where they have to sit down, people are always like, wow, your kids are super well behaved. And then they're like, you know, what do you do? We're like spankings. <laughs> and then they're like, I don't know. That's not what I want to do, right? But here's the thing. When they're kids, if they're your next door neighbor and you have, they have super bad kids, you wonder why these kids are like punching their kid, their par parents in the face and stuff. I mean, I've seen some horrible things. And you think my kids would do that to, to <laughs> Jessica or myself? No, they know they get their butt wore out. And here's the thing, when, when your neighbor sees like, wow, their kids are great, and they're not spanking their kids, and their kids are horrible, they're probably, that, I mean, it's the perfect example of this. They're going to probably come to you and ask, hey, what are you doing that, you know, why, why are your kids great and my kids bad? I don't think they would say that, but why are your kids well behaved and mine are not, right? And then you tell them, well, you know, you could, that's a perfect example, hey, the Bible says, Thou shalt beat them. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but you can open up the Bible and show them what the Bible teaches. You should spank your children. And there should be a fear of the, of the parent. Amen. There should be. You know, why do you think, why don't you run a red light? Because you're afraid that you're going to get hit by a car if you don't, right? Their fear is not a bad thing. That's a good thing that you don't run a red light, right? The Bible teaches that it's a good thing to fear your government. You know why? You know, sometimes when people, you know, want to do something bad and they don't, when they're angry or whatever, because everybody gets angry and wants to do something that they shouldn't do, a lot of times because they're fearful of the punishment. Do you know why, um, a reason why you should, uh, you know, keep God's commandments? Because you should be fearful of God. Because God can punish you. Fear is a good thing. And fear can get you to do that which is right. And that's an example of, you know, keeping, of, you know, uh, being a good testimony. Being a good testimony unto Gentiles, unto people that are not saved.
Keep reading. Go back to Romans chapter number 13. We'll keep reading there. <clears throat> Verse 8. Owe no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. So notice the importance that's put on loving one another. And then he says, verse 9, for this. Now he's getting ready to name the law. He's getting ready to you know, name off a couple of things of the law of the Old Testament. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. So he's naming off the uh, uh, thou shalt not covet. The last five commandments, right? The last five commandments of the Ten Commandments have to do with how you treat your neighbor. A lot of people probably haven't noticed that, but the Ten Commandments, the first five have to do with keeping, you know, of, of loving God, right? The last five have to do with loving your neighbor. Right. The first five, you know what's more important? Loving God. The, the next thing after that is love your neighbor. You should love your neighbor. And you know what those things are? Look at all this stuff. Committing adultery. You're not loving your neighbor. Thou shalt not kill. That you're obviously not loving your neighbor. Thou shalt not steal, right? You're not showing love on your neighbor for taking things that are his. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not covet. Now watch what he says, and I'm going to prove that to you. If there be any other commandment, he's speaking about, about uh, you know, anything that you would do as far as to your brother. That's the subject, the context. It is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely... Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So you know how to keep those five commandments? You just love your neighbor. If you loved your neighbor, you wouldn't commit adultery with his wife. If you loved your neighbor, you wouldn't covet things that were your neighbor. If you loved your neighbor, you're obviously not going to kill him. You're not going to steal things from someone that you love. So he's saying, you know, an easy, uh, uh, you know, if you just keep that commandment, you know, loving your neighbor, you would keep all the other five commandments. If you were to just keep that one commandment. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And he goes on to explain this concept. Why, if you love your neighbor as yourself, why you would be able to keep those five commandments. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. What does it mean when it says works no ill? It means that you're not going to hurt him, right? Now, whether that be, you know, physically or financially, whatever it may be, you wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't do any harm to him if you loved him, right? Love works no ill to his neighbor, Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Loving your neighbor, that alone would be fulfilling those five commandments. Not killing your neighbor, obviously. Not stealing. You would be, you know, uh, if you were to keep those, that one law, you would keep all five, all the last five commandments. Now, I want you to turn to Leviticus 19.11 because a lot of people go, you know, they'll take this to... They'll take this to the point where it's like, well, you're not loving your neighbor if you ever say anything what they would consider mean, right? Because, you know, modern Christianity, which is extremely liberal and is not biblical Christianity at all, you know, they would take this to the point where it's like, well, then you should never even say anything mean. <clears throat> That's what it means to love someone. But I'm going to actually show to you that if your neighbor does something that they shouldn't be doing, if your neighbor is in sin... The loving thing to do is what the Bible calls to rebuke them. It means to strongly correct them. And the Bible actually says that if you don't do that, that you're not loving your neighbor. And the way to love your neighbor is, is to correct them sternly. So, you know, people have put, since people are oversensitive today, and just, you know, it's just, you know, just shoved into your mind constantly, just be what they would say nice, just be nice to everyone constantly all the time. That's not a biblical concept. Now, we should be, try to be kind to everyone when we can, but there are times when people need to be corrected, and everything's not going to be nice all the time. And the Bible teaches that if you're nice all the time, then that's not loving, because sometimes people need you to not be nice to them in order to, for them to do that which is right. right. Now, here's the thing. I want you to turn back, like I said, to Leviticus 19.11, where this command is actually given. In Leviticus uh, chapter 19, verse 11, he's talking about loving your neighbor. And there's something real interesting right here in uh, Leviticus 19. I think it's 11. Yeah, yeah. Leviticus 19, 11, he says in verse 11, You shall not steal, neither deal falsely, neither lie one to another. So those that live together, speak. this is when the commandments were given to the nation of Israel. So it's their neighbor, right? One to another. It's their neighbors. They were living together. So you, you notice it's the same subject, too. Not stealing. You know, not dealing falsely with who? Your neighbor. One to another, right? Verse 12. And ye shall not swear by not my name falsely. Saying so you shouldn't swear by my name falsely like take the name of the Lord in vain. 
Neither shalt thou profane the name of thy God. Again, talking about, you know, uh, taking the name of the Lord in vain. I am the Lord. You shouldn't be just saying Jesus or Lord for no reason. Because <clears throat> you, you, that's profaning his name because his name is holy. Verse 13, it says this. Thou shalt not defraud thy neighbor. Like, do wrong to your neighbor. Take something from your neighbor and not pay him back, right? And then it says, neither rob him. So defrauding him would be robbing him. So he's talking about loving your neighbor, right? That's the whole subject right now, right? The wages of him that is hired shall not abide with thee all night until the morning. So at that time, they paid people. Like, we pay people at the end of the week. They pay people at the end of the day. And he's saying, you're defrauding him by not paying him his wages. You shouldn't try to, like, you're defrauding your neighbor if you don't pay him after he works for you. Right? Verse 14. Thou shalt not curse the deaf, nor put a stumbling block before the blind, but shalt fear thy God. I am the Lord. Verse 15, keep reading. Ye shall do no unrighteousness in judgment. Thou shalt not respect the person of the poor, nor honor the person of the mighty, but in righteousness shalt thou judge thy neighbor. So we're still talking about the same thing, judging your neighbor, doing that which is right to your neighbor, right? Look at verse 16. Thou shalt not go up and down as a talebearer among thy people. Talking about gossiping, right? That's one of the most hurtful things you can do. Gossip about someone else's business that's hurtful to them. Neither shalt thou stand against the blood of thy neighbor. I am the Lord. Now watch verse 17. Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thine heart. So he's saying don't hate your brother. He's talking about your neighbor, right? Thou shalt in any wise. So he's saying in, in, in that situation, in any way, watch this, rebuke thy neighbor. So notice what he said. He said you shouldn't hate your brother in your heart. He's talking about if your brother does something wrong, right? You don't hate him if he does something wrong. If Brother Hall does something wrong to me, right? I shouldn't hate my brother in my heart, right, Brother Hall? But the Bible teaches that I should correct him or rebuke him. See, when he's telling you, hey, love your neighbor, you know, and then later on when your neighbor does you wrong, he says, hey, love your neighbor, and you shouldn't hate your neighbor, you shouldn't hate your brother, but you should rebuke him. That alone right there means that rebuking or sternly correcting someone is loving. He's saying that if you weren't to sternly correct someone, then you hate him. Like that, you're like not doing him, you're not doing anything good for him. If, here's the thing if someone is about to, you know, something bad is getting ready to happen in someone's life, if my neighbor is like, you know, my neighbor's like, I, I can't think of anything off the top of my head, you know, he, he's, he's making a bad decision in his life, and it's an evil decision. Let's say it's a, a, someone in our church, right? They're about to make a really bad decision, or they already, let's say they already made a bad decision, and it was very hurtful to someone else. If you don't go and correct that person, if you know about it and you say nothing, that, that's not loving, that's hateful. Here's the thing, sometimes people need a swift kick in the butt for them to do the right thing. You know, this, like, when you, you know what you do is you destroy someone by just allowing them to keep doing that which is wrong and not correcting them. You know, look at the fruits of like these liberal churches that do that. They're just like, never talk about anything bad, never say anything bad, don't pre preach the commandments of God. And then they're living in fornication. They have 50 partners and three, you know, three uh, children by three different, you know, uh, uh, men or women, whatever it may be. They're drunkards and they're, you know, they're getting drunk all the time and they're waking up with their own vomit. They're wrecking a car and killing somebody and going to jail. They're committing adultery when they grow up and they're, you know, they're, they're, they're end up getting divorced. If you knew that they were heading down that path and you didn't correct them, you don't love them, you hate them. Right. Yet you should have said something to them. And all these pastors that stand behind pulpits, and the Bible says very clearly that you're supposed to rebuke your neighbor in order to show them that they love them, they don't love their congregation. Right. Right. When they stand up and they don't correct their congregation, and they don't preach what the Bible preaches about any of these subjects, fornication, how harmful these things are, God's law is practical for your life. Right. Amen. It, you, you want to live a, 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 a happy life, then keep God's law. You want to live a miserable life, then neglect God's law. Look at the fruits of people's lives that don't keep the commandments. Amen. Look at like people that just, here's the thing. If, if, you know, if, look at someone that takes the Bible to its extreme and just keeps all the commandments. And look at their life. They have a happy marriage. They're never committing adultery. They're loving, you know, Bible commands the man to love his wife. The woman to be in subjection to her husband. You look at that authority structure and it works perfect. Spanking your children. The kids are, you know, well behaved. They love their parents. 
right? No drinking. You're not, you know, you're not, you know, uh, just wrecking vehicles. What all oh, the horrible things that happen? People make bad decisions when they're drunk. Look at, look at that, and then look at the other extreme. You know what? They end up being homeless on the street. Seriously, people that like start drinking, they start doing drugs, and they take that to the extreme. It destroys their life. It destroys their life. You know, you want happiness, you, you keep the commandments of the Bible. Amen. You live your life according to God's word. That's the way that you'll have happiness. So if someone is violating God's commandment, and it's a brother in Christ, it's a neighbor, someone that you know believes the Bible and is a Christian, it's, it's, you're, you're not loving them by not correcting them. You're hating them. Because you're not, when it says hating them, you're not treating them like you love them. If I knew that a decision that my neighbor was going to make was going to destroy his life and I didn't say anything to him, do you think I love that person? Are you kidding me? No, like the Bible says, you're, that, it looks like you hate them. You know, so this idea that loving your neighbor means never saying anything bad to them or never saying you know, anything that would you know, offend them, like we should never offend people, that's not biblical because when the command is given to love your neighbor, he tells you, don't hate your neighbor, love your neighbor, and if your neighbor does something wrong, you need to rebuke him. And rebuke is like, there's, there's reproof, which is like a mild correction. Rebuke is like, you know, it's a serious correction. And it's loving to do that. People are too sensitive nowadays is what it is. We live in a culture where people are just like, you know, <clears throat> just tell me how great I am. You know, everybody gets a reward. That's the type of culture we live in where nobody wants anyone, any, I mean, does your boss love you if he just allows you to keep you know, being a crappy employee and making mistakes? No, because he's eventually going to fire you. Your boss shows love to you when he corrects you when you're wrong. If I allow my children to do whatever they wanted and to make bad decisions, do you think that I love them? No. You know how I show that I love my children? is because I want them to do that which is right, so I correct them when they do that which is wrong. You know how you, you prove that you love your neighbor? You don't do wrong to your neighbor. You don't harm your neighbor, but guess what? If your neighbor, neighbor does something wrong, you need to correct them. That's showing love to them. So, you know, we need to make sure that we have biblical definitions of what it means to love someone. And love is not always, you know, it's not always, you know, it's not always just kindness. People equate love with kindness. Yes, in a, in a, in a big way that's true, but there are times when you have to do something that's loving that's not kind. You know what I mean? Like, I have to spank my children because I love them and I want them to do that which is right. Right? Now, would you say that that is just the ultimate show of kindness? Of course not. But it's loving because that will get them to be a good child. Amen. You everyone understand what I'm saying? Look at Romans 13. <clears throat> he says, and that, and that knowing, verse, verse 11, chapter 13, verse 11, and that knowing the time, because he's speaking because it's the last days, right? Knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. He's saying, wake up. You know, it's getting close. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. The same thing is true for you today, right? The moment that you believe, you're saved. Amen. The Bible says, you know, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved, right? Your soul is, the Bible says that you're given the Holy Spirit at that moment and you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Nothing can change that. Amen. But is your body saved right now? That's why you continue to sin. Because the same flesh that you had before, the same lusts of the flesh still live in your body. So you can, you can keep going down a bad path, or now that you have the Holy Spirit, you can start reading the Bible, and you can start going down the path and walking in the Spirit like the Bible says. Right? And what happens is, at the moment you believe, you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, your soul is saved, but your body's not yet saved. When is your body saved? When Jesus comes back, you know, when, at the moment that Jesus comes back, everyone that, the dead in Christ, their bodies will resurrect and their body will be glorified, Amen. right? Those that are living on the earth at that time, Jesus Christ comes back, and they will be caught up, the Bible says, to meet him in the air and their bodies will be glorified at that moment. At that very moment, then their bodies will be saved. Let's look at the end of the real quick, 1 Corinthians 15, where the Bible talks about that. We're, we're about done, we're just going to read those other verses. I had a couple other references, but I went on a little longer than I wanted to. 1 Corinthians 15, at the very end, he talks about this. Great verses about when Jesus comes back and our bodies are changed. For this corruptible, talking about our body is corrupt, must put on incorruption. And this mortal, our bodies are, are you know, prone to death, right? 
And this mortal shall put on immortality. So in this corruptible shall have put on incorruption. And this mortal shall have put on immortality. Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written. So he's going to quote the Old Testament. This is a, I love this verse why I turned here. Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? And then he says, the sting of death is sin, and, and the strength of sin is the law. So notice that in those verse right there, it says that our body, this corruptible, must put on incorruption, right? This mortal saying this body that is corrupt, this body that, that is a mortal body that will die, at that, at that moment will be given a glorified body, and our body will be saved. So when this says right here, our salvation is nearer than when we believe, it's talking about the salvation of our body when Jesus comes back and we're saved at that moment. In, in you know, our, the second phase is consummated. Our salvation is consummated at that point. Verse 12, the night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness. So because the time is near, he's saying cast off the works of darkness. Don't spend you know, this, la this, these, this last opportunity just you know, doing evil, right? He says, and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envy. So don't, don't waste your time on silly things, envying someone else, strife, fighting with brothers and sisters in Christ. That's a waste of time. You know, be unified and do, do something that's meaningful, something that's profitable, like soul winning, something you'll read in your Bible. Amen. Verse 14, it says this, But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ. And make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Now I'm going to point out one last thing before we turn off, you know, you know, uh, before we end the sermon. Verse 14, notice what it says, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you guys know when that phrase is found? Bro, all you can't answer because I told you beforehand. You know where that, that phrase is found? Uh, when it talks about put ye on something? Anyone else know where that phrase is found in the Bible? Ephesians Yeah, it's in Ephesians 6. And notice he mentions the armor of light here. He talks about putting on the whole armor of God, but I know I, that's, that's somewhat of an application. It actually applies even deeper, but in Ephesians 4 and, the, and in Colossians 1, he says, put on the new man, and he tells him not to walk in the flesh. So you know when he says, put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, you know what he's telling him to walk in? The Spirit. Amen. So yeah, you know, you know what the Lord Jesus Christ is? The Spirit. So he's saying, put on the new man. It's two times. Colossians 1, Ephesians 4, 4.24. Ephesians 4.24, like, I can't remember, Colossians 1, like, like 17 or something like that. He says, put on the new man, right? When he says, don't make provisions for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof at the end of Romans 13, what, is a, what does provisions mean? It's like, it's like to prepare something. To provision something means to prepare it or to have it ready. So he's saying, don't make provisions for the flesh. Don't, like, put yourself... In a situation to sin, right? If you know that that there's you know something that you're tempted with, then you need to just not put yourself in a situation where you're going to sin, right? Because right? the flesh, you know, like Jesus said, the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Your flesh is weak. Man is sinful at his nature, and if you just go somewhere where you're going to be tempted, you 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 know tempted to look at something, tempted to do something, you know what you need to do? You need to stay away from that. Amen. And if you keep doing that, you know what you're doing? You're putting yourself in a situation to sin. He's saying don't make provisions for the flesh. Don't, provision is like I said, make, you know, uh, making something ready. He's saying that you're basically like setting yourself up to make, you know, to sin for the provision of the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. So put thee on the Lord Jesus Christ, which is the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. Let's go ahead and have a word Amen. of prayer. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for this night, dear Lord. We thank you for all those that came out tonight. We ask you, dear Lord, the families that, were, that weren't here, the Martinez, we're not sure what was wrong with them, but that uh, whatever uh, hindered them from, from coming to church tonight, dear Lord, that you'd be with them. The rays, that you'd be with them while, they, while their flight uh, is, uh, is, is uh, flying to uh, San Diego right now, dear God. And we also ask you that you would be with Mrs. Yates uh, with her back injury, that you would help her to have a quick recovery, dear Heavenly Father, and that she would not be in too much pain. To ease her of that pain, dear Lord, we ask you that you continue to bless our church, be with us, keep us all safe, and uh, as I said, just be with us each day. In Jesus Christ's name, amen.